this clock is based on a PIC microcontroller and the DS1302 real-time clock I see. You can adjust the hours, the minutes and you can switch between 24 hour mode and AM PM mode. But the really cool feature is that whenever you disconnect the power and then reconnect it again, everything is still there. The clock also remembers in what mode it was before it was switched off. So let's get started and learn everything about the DS1302 real-time clock. The clock that doesn't forget the time. Hi, my name is Jens and I believe that everybody can learn electronics. And this channel is all about beginner-friendly electronics tutorials and projects with and without microcontrollers. And if you want to follow along today's tutorial, here's what you need. An 830-pin breadboard, a 4.5-volt AA battery compartment and a coin cell battery compartment and of course also the batteries. The PIC16F1455 microcontroller, the DS1302 real-time clock IC, a 32.768 kHz watch crystal, four 1 kOhm resistors, four common anode LED displays and two LEDs, four TLC5916 LED driver ICs, three push buttons, six 100 nanofarad bypass capacitors and one chunky 100 microfarad bulk capacitor. You also need the Picket 3 as well as a six terminal connecting cable and some single stranded wire and I find that American wire gauge 24 or 0.6 millimeters works quite well. As always, you can find links to all of these components in the companion article on FriendlyWire.com along with a lot more in-depth information on this tutorial, so check it out later if you want. The schematic for this clock looks a bit complicated, but it helps to split it into smaller pieces. This whole part up here, for example, controls the four seven segment LED displays and the two LEDs. And it is exactly the same circuit we already used in the TLC5916 tutorial a little while ago. The 100 nanofarad capacitors are bypass capacitors for stability and the 1 kilo ohm resistors fix the current to around 18 milliamps. The only difference to before is that the 7 segments decimal point is only connected for the left display because it works as a PM indicator and the two LEDs in the middle are connected to where the decimal point would have been for the second and third display. The latch enable clock and output enable lines are all connected in parallel to the PIC16F 1455 down here and the SDI pin of the first TLC5916 gets the data directly from the PIC before it's passed down the line to the following drivers over their SDO outputs. By the way, if you want, you can also add two more displays towards the end here for the seconds. In this video, we won't do that because the circuit wouldn't fit on a breadboard that way, but the PIC software that we will talk about later fully supports it without any changes. The PIC 16F1455 is also connected to the DS1302 real-time clock IC, which is the real star of the show today, and provides the PIC with the time information over the three wires clock, IO and CE, and the clock line is shared between the DS1302 and the TLC5916 drivers. Other than that, the DS1302 needs a crystal and a simple 3 volt coin cell battery G2. And last on the right, we have the three push buttons that let the user control the clock. Okay, but how does the DS1302 work and how can we use it? This is how it looks like from the inside. On the right you can see its internal clock module that starts running as soon as a crystal and a buffer battery are connected. It draws very little power and can run for years. The frequency of the crystal is 32.768 kHz because that is just 2 to the power of 15 and it's easy for the clock to arrive at a stable 1 Hz frequency that way. The DS1302 has two built-in memory banks. The real-time clock memory, or RTC memory for short, contains the current time information and is constantly updated. There is also some general purpose RAM that can be used freely to store user settings or other information. The data in these two memory banks is stored for as long as the buffer battery has power. If you connect the main power connections as well here on the left, then the DS1302 can talk to the outside world using a serial protocol and the three wire CE, which stands for chip enable, IO, which is a bidirectional data input and output, and a clock pin. When the CE input is high, the control logic is active and we can access the RAM or RTC memory and have full read and write access. So let's talk about this serial protocol a little bit. There are basically two options we have reading data or sending new data. And these two operations are always split into two parts. 
we have to send a command byte to the DS1302 and then we either receive an answer byte back from the DS1302 or send another command byte to the DS1302 depending on the case. Let's look at how to read data first. We first have to turn CE on and leave it on for the entire duration of the process and turn it off later. Let's focus on clock and I.O. For reading a byte in the DS1302's memory, we have to send out 8 bits like this. A0 to A4 are the address of the information we are after and if R is equal to 0, we are asking to look into the RTC memory and if R is 1 instead, we are asking to look into the RAM. The arrows on the clock line mean that the DS1302 reads every bit on its I.O. pin at the rising edge of clock. And as soon as we have transmitted these 8 bits, the DS1302 responds by putting the 8 response bits D0 to D8 at the I.O. pin at every falling edge of clock. Say we want the DS1302 to tell us the current value of the minutes. Looking at the datasheet of the DS1302, which you can download from my website in the companion article, we see that this address is 1, so A0 is 1 and A1 to A4 are all 0. And because this information is in the RTC, we set R to 0 as well. Say the DS1302 responds with this information here. Internally, the DS1302 works with binary coded decimals. So the first four bits are the ones and the second four bits are the tens. So this answer byte means that the minutes are 29. And when we want to write to the memory, it works almost the same way. Now the command byte looks like this and the only difference to before is that there used to be a one here and now it's a zero. Immediately after transmitting the command byte, we can transmit the new data that should be written into that address inside the DS1302, all again at the rising edge of the clock signal. For the minutes to be set to 37, for example, we would have to send this byte here. And for accessing the general purpose RAM, it works exactly the same way. The only difference is that we have to set the R bit to 1 instead of 0. I know this sounds a bit confusing, so as always I wrote a detailed companion article that explains all of these concepts in a lot more detail, so check that out later if you want. And now we have to write a program that tells the PIC microcontroller exactly how to do all that. Now if you're new to microcontrollers, I have an introduction video for you right here. Um, honestly, I never really know how much detail I should include on the source code in this type of video. So if you have any suggestions, tell me what you like and what you don't like in the comments. And for today, we're going to have a look at a sketch instead. And just very quickly, this is the entire source code. It looks a bit scary, I know, but each part is actually quite simple. I have a very detailed explanation of all of this code in the companion article on FriendlyWire.com as well. So if you want to learn more about all the nitty gritty details, go check that out after this video. But in a nutshell, the PIC microcontroller has to do three things. Send out the data to the LEDs, react whenever a push button is pressed, and communicate with the DS1302 real-time clock. It also uses an interrupt service routine or ISR for short to animate the flashing dots of the clock and to debounce the push buttons. So what do you do with all that code? Well, it gets compiled into a hex file and that hex file has to be flashed onto the PIC microcontroller. So let's do that next. Connect the PIC 16F1455 to the PICKit 3 with five wires like this. And here is how it looks like in the real world. Connect the PicKit 3 to your computer and launch the freely available MPLAB 10 IPE, the integrated programming environment. Under device, type in PIC 16F1455 and click on apply if necessary and then select the PicKit 3 as your tool. Click on the power tab, scroll down and select power target circuit from tool as well as use high voltage program mode entry. Back on operate, you can now click on connect and after confirming this dialog here, you should see the message target device pic 16 f1455 found. Now it's time to load the hex file by clicking on browse and if you don't have the hex file on your computer, you can download it from the resources box from the companion article. Select the hex file, click on open and then on program. The picket 3 will start blinking and after a few seconds, you should see the message programming complete. Congrats, that was the hard part. Remove the pick, 
put it aside because now it's finally time to build the circuit on the breadboard. First we have to prepare the 7 segment LED displays a little bit by soldering longer wires to them. This allows for a really nice way to plug the displays right on top of the TLC5916 driver ICs, making for a super compact breadboard design. And if you want to learn more about just how exactly to do that, check out the TLC5916 driver IC tutorial where I explain this in a lot of detail. And with the LED displays taken care of, let's take a look at the breadboard and our schematic, which I rearranged slightly so that we can fit everything on the screen at all times. Insert the four TLC5916 driver ICs in rows 1, 11, 24 and 34 and make sure their notches point to the left. Their pins are labeled like this. Then insert the PIC16F1455 in row 43 and make sure its notch points to the right. And last insert the DS1302 real time clock IC in row 51 and make sure its notch points to the right as well. Their pins are labeled like this. Now it's time to connect power. VDD is pin 16 for the TLC5916 and pin 1 for the PIC and the DS1302. Ground is pin 1 for the TLCs, pin 14 for the PIC and pin 4 for the DS1302. Next connect the 100 nanofarad bypass capacitors C1 through C6 close to each chip right between the power supply pins and also insert the 100 microfarad bulk capacitor C7 in the power rail. Make sure its negative terminal, the one with the big minus sign, plugs into the blue ground rail. Now for each TLC5916 driver, insert the resistors R1 through R4 between pin 15 and ground. And isn't that just a lovely alignment right here? Anyway, next insert LD5 in rows 22 and 23. It's a bit hard to see from this perspective, but the LED's cathode is here and its anode is here. Connect its anode to the VDD rail and its cathode to pin 8 of IC2. LED 6 also goes in rows 22 and 23 and its anode is here and its cathode is here. Just as before, connect its anode to the VDD rail and connect its cathode to pin 8 of IC3. Now it's time to start working on the signal bus. Connect all slash OE inputs at pin 13 of the TLC5916 in parallel. I connected the wires in a staggered way so that it looks nice. Then connect each SDO output at pin 14 to the SDI input at pin 2 of the next TLC5916. The clock inputs of each TLC5916 at pin 3 are also connected in parallel and I like to use the staggered wiring again as well as a different color. And last, connect all ledge enable inputs at pin 4 in parallel as well. And now we can turn our attention to the DS1302 real time clock. Insert the 32.768 kHz watch crystal between pins 2 and 3 of the DS1302 and make sure it is as close to the chip as possible. I actually soldered my crystal to a small 2 pin header so that it can be easily inserted into the breadboard. Its wires are very thin and the crystal is tiny. Here you can see it with some friends. If you don't want to do this or cannot solder, then no worries, you can just use a readily made DS1302 module like this one right here and connect it to the circuit with jumper wires. Then connect the DS1302's control pins to the PIC. Connect clock to pin 10, IO to pin 9 and CE to pin 8. And next connect the slash OE inputs to pin 5 of the PIC, the ledge enable inputs to pin 6 and the SDI input of the leftmost TLC5916 to pin 7 and clock to pin 10. Now insert the three push buttons in rows 55, 58 and 61. Connect their right terminals to the ground rail and then connect the other terminals to pins 2, 3 and 4 of the PIC 16F1455. And now we can finally connect the two power rails on either side of the breadboard. Connect pin 1 of the PIC 16F1455 all the way down into the positive power rail and connect pin 4 of the DS1302 to the ground rail like this. Speaking of power, it's time for the buffer battery. Insert a wire from row 63 on the upper part of the breadboard down to row 62 and then plug the battery holder into the breadboard with its positive terminal, the squarish side, connected to pin 8 of the DS1302. Make sure that the battery compartment's negative terminal lines up with the wire we just plugged in. And now it's time to plug in the 7 segment displays one after the other. The installation is super smooth when you have bent the wires correctly and this is how it looks like. It's a bit hard to film and there are some extra pictures in the companion article. And last, connect the power and your clock is working.
I had a lot of fun with this tutorial because using a real-time clock has been on my bucket list forever and I just never got around to it and well, now I have and I hope so will you. But as always, there are things that can be improved. When you're building this clock yourself, I recommend to use smaller displays with a lower forward voltage because with a 4.5 volt battery pack, these large LEDs are actually quite dim, which is why I connected everything to my bench power supply at 5 volt in the end. But there is another problem. Looking at the working clock, maybe you noticed the strange places where I connected the power. I did this to minimize the distance between the LEDs and their drivers. I had to do this because the breadboard power rails have a resistance of a few ohms, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually is. With all segments turned on, this circuit draws around 600 milliamps, and at only 1 ohm, this is a voltage drop of 0.6 volt, which is quite substantial. So the best thing probably would have been to use a dedicated LED power rail at around 6 or 7 volt and just generate the 5 volt for the pick and the real time clock with an LM317 voltage regulator. But let's not forget the real star of the show, the DS1302 real time clock and I think that part was a huge success. Its accuracy isn't crazy good, it's around a few seconds per week and that could definitely be improved. So if you want to use it for commercial applications it's probably not a good choice, but for hobbyists like me this is just perfect. I really hope that you found this tutorial useful and that I could inspire you to give it a try yourself. I think the DS1302 is a really cool device and I'll be using it in a lot of my future projects. Thank you so much for watching, let me know what else you want to learn and I'll see you next time.